Well, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, Alice, for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll remember to hold it down now. Hi. Thank you guys for coming. It's so nice to see everyone. It's been different from a Zoom meeting, huh? Being here, even if it's not the big 2019 crowd. Yeah, no, it's amazing to be with people. So it's been pretty special. It is. So you have two movies here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll just jump into the first trailer. And then we can talk about the film. And okay. obviously about your process, which I'm totally interested about. Amazing. Thank you. Let me just listen to my block. It's quiet. Usually the one train's up there screeching. Oh, so much stuff going on. Just got me thinking about all the people I care about the most. There's a breeze off the Hudson. And just when you think you're sick of living here, the memory floods in. The morning light off the fire escapes. The nights in Bender Park blasting big pun tapes. It's a story of a block that was disappearing once upon a time in a faraway land called Washington Heights. Who's gonna notice we're going? Say it so it doesn't disappear. Washington Heights! Look who's home! Bad changes happening on the block since you've been at school. When it came to dreams, we had to keep scraping by. Ice cold feet agua. Silly when we get into these crazy hypotheticals. You really want some bread, then go ahead, create a set of goals. I pick a business school and pay the entrance fee. And maybe if you're lucky, you'll stay friends with me. They used to say, you work hard, you live by the rules, the things will come, and those things will heal you. I'm not gonna sit here and give you some fairy tale. Ignore anyone who doubts you. Because this place, this is it. I just want to see a whole world through our eyes. Let's go! Go show them who we are. Today's all we got, so we cannot stop. This is our block! This is the moment where you do better than me. Because you can see a future that I can. Sonny, you're late. You know you love me? We can pay off the debts we owe. Tell everyone we know. We are not powerless. We are powerful. What's your relationship to music? To music? Um, well, I grew up in New York. My father was a playwright, and my mom was an actress, dancer, singer. And we, uh, there, so music was always in our house. We, we went to Broadway shows when we could, and, but we always had different musicals playing in our house. Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein. Uh, Sound of Music, My Fair Lady, and so uh, some of, I just, we just grew up with my mom singing to us all the time. Because I've always seen this a huge relationship between images and music, and, and rhythm especially. Is that something, when preparing for the movie, going into the music, and how does it affect, you know, everything you do? So on this movie, I worked with a director named John M. Chu, who I've known since college. We went to USC to film school together. So we met 20 years ago, and we bonded over our love of musicals. We did a short film there, his thesis film, called When the Kids Are Away. And at the time, very few musicals were being made. It was very much um, sort of a lost genre. Chicago hadn't come out yet, and Moulin Rouge hadn't come out yet. This was, this was spring of 2002. And when we, when he approached me, I was completely amazed and blown away that someone wanted to make a musical because that was what I dreamed of doing when I grew up and no one was doing it. And so we made this musical short and then, and then we didn't do stuff for a while. And then in 2009, John called me and said, I've got this idea for this web series. And 
this was at the very beginning of web content, and it was one of Hulu's first produced shows, and it was called the League, League of Extraordinary Dancers, the LXD. And so when, and he said, it's really gonna be an experiment, there are no rules, they're letting us do what we want, and, and we're just gonna play. And so every episode on that movie was a different genre, but it was all dance. But we did a Western, and we did a horror one, and we did a ballet, and. Uh, sort of like a teenage contemporary one in a j high school gym. And, and we started working with the choreographer, Christopher Scott, who ended up doing um, In the Heights with us. And we did 30 episodes over three years, and it really became this amazing playground to learn to tell a story through music, through song and dance. And, and, and we messed up in huge ways sometimes, we, we could risk anything. There was nothing riding on it. And so we tried and we experimented and we played. And, and, then, and then for the next decade, we started, we did a bunch of other musically driven things. And once we got to In the Heights, John said to Chris and I somewhere in the middle of it, he's like, do you realize we've worked our whole careers to make this movie? And, and I, think, I think the fact that we got to play so much plays into like rhythm and and lighting with rhythm too. Can you explain a little bit more what it means to work with music to do musicals in that kind of a way? What you learned or what didn't work, especially maybe? As well? Oh gosh, I don't remember quite what didn't work. I mean, back a decade ago, but it was it was it was well. I mean, we we would try lighting dancers from different angles and seeing and and just playing a lot with lighting because i was i was interested in like how bodies move through space and so at first i started just doing environmental lighting and and one of our first episodes was probably one of my favorites and and it was very simple but i don't know if i can answer any further than that or you can oh sure um if we break it down let's say lighting because you were mentioning that uh, what do you look for in lighting when lighting people going through space? That's a beautiful way to put it. Yeah, so for instance, In the Heights, it's a big club number, and we start upstairs and we move downstairs, and so the way we lit it environmentally, but we never like lit a close-up. It was all environmental light. Or in this scene in particular, we used lots of moving theatrical lights. So throughout the scene, we've got this sort of warm color and amber color, and what we did was we had moving cyan lights throughout so that your eye never got used to anything. There's lots of storytelling elements in this. We need to learn a lot about the relationship between this character, Vanessa, and, and our lead, Usnavi, and so, but we lit the space. And I think the fact that I had, had so much practice on LXD lighting space versus, versus just lighting, lighting actors' faces made a big difference. It's a really interesting point you make about when you wash something in a color and that you need contrast not to get used to it. Um, is that something you did just do automatically now, or was it something like you do additive? You try out one color, and then from there you go on to the next. Do you have color palettes, actually, in combination that work well for you? Well, this scene we knew we were going to do. We, we, during our tests, we had picked out this red and this yellow color, and, and, and we loved it. But then once we got into this huge space, we realized, our eye was very, very quickly adjust, just everything seemed, looked the same. It, the yellow and the red weren't different enough to, to make your mind um, see anything but that. And so um, I, remember, I remember watching a movie called 13 where I really started to understand how used to color you can get because um, I had it on DVD and I watched it all the way through and then I, Re, or I rewound it and on high speed and I could watch the whole movie go backwards and I could see the color slowly shift. And so your eye gets so, and there's a huge difference between the first scene and the last scene, but it, it was something they didn't want, the, 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 the filmmakers didn't want you to know that, right? Like they wanted it to shift without it being completely conscious. But here we didn't just want you to get used to, this is the only scene we have this color palette and so we didn't want anyone's eye to get used to that. I mean, it's an interesting thing, right? Because it's not only about how we perceive stuff on set, it's actually what happens afterwards in the audience in terms of, you know, progression of stories. That's something that you were working on as well with colors and palettes, how they shift throughout the movie? 
We play a lot with color in, in, in the Heights, um, but it's, it, nothing is super saturated, and the, the, the way we found our color palette, it, it, we don't have a big shift through, through the movie at all. It, it, um, until the very last scene in the bodega, and there is a big shift, but it's not, um, it's not, it's a natural shift. It's not like anything goes crazy, so. I mean, you can see it in the trailer because it's like this boost of energy coming up. So it totally makes sense what you're saying. So you were using color just to enheighten the moment? Well, what's unique about In the Heights is each character's hopes and dreams and their fears and their anxiety can be told not only through song and dance, but through the environment around them. And sometimes the environment shifts to um, shifts visually to where they are emotionally. And so the, and, and those num when things shift visually, it's in the musical numbers. So we have, we have sort of this everyday life, and then, and then the first time we see a hint of something shifting visually is you've got our lead actor um, at, in the very opening number, he's walking across the street, there's no dancing yet, and he steps on a piece of gum and he scrapes it on a manhole cover, and the manhole cover starts to spin. And it's just this little hint uh, that there's gonna be magic later on, and, and we build up sort of that trust in the audience to the moment where we have um, the, the dancers on the side of the building dancing and defying gravity. And so, uh, and, then, and, then the, and then the first time we see any dance in the movie is also in the opening number, but it's much later. We've now introduced all our characters, and the bodega owner goes up to the win storefront window. He's inside, and he goes up to the storefront window, and you s we introduce dancing at the very beginning through a reflection. And, and then suddenly now we're in his dream. We're in his, his version of what his hopes and dreams are when he steps outside onto the street, and now the streets are filled with dancers. So when you, for example, have the scene here in the, in the, in the uh, whatever environment, in the club, yeah, it's something you pre-light, you look at, you, you, and for the dancing as well, is that stuff that's being rehearsed? So the dancing, the dancers and the actors showed up 12 weeks before we started shooting, and they had music boot camp, dance boot camp, because some, some of our actors aren't dancers, and so, like, Vanessa was not a salsa dancer, and she had to learn, and it was one of the hardest, I mean, I watched her, it was, I mean, to, to learn to dance in 12 weeks is pretty intense, and, and it just completely remarkable um, how all the actors threw themselves into this. So my days were spent, I'd spend the mornings location scouting with the director and the production designer, and then in the afternoons, the director and the production designer and I, or not the production designer, the director, the choreographer, and I would be at dance rehearsal, and we'd see what they had done during the day. And we didn't rehearse in order, and there were, and sometimes it started with only a few people and then started building out. Um, but but we're also in a dance studio, and so we're in a space that has tape lines on the ground to sort of, and so we understand what our space was. But the club we didn't find till very late, and so we didn't know what the space was going to be. So we were actually rehearsing in smaller spaces than, than what we ended up. I should back up, during prep we had picked the colors. And so then during that test day, that's when we started to notice it wasn't gonna work unless we had a cyan to get thrown in there. Sure, I was always wondering about that. Do you, with working with a lighting designer and, and figuring out what their part of the job is, where do you think is the biggest difference in terms of how they work or how it works together with the gaffer and with you? How does that work? Well, for, with her, it was, it, it was great because we were in a real club and so we were able to use some of the light fixtures there to save money and then, and then there was a we had our, a dimmer board op with us the whole movie, but there was an in-house dimmer board op. So it, it's sort of, um, I've done this a couple of times where we go into real spaces, theaters and things where, where there's a dimmer board and you can't, the person in the theater or in the club needs to still control that dimmer board. And so Christina sort of was like the, the person between, between film and live, kind of lighting and so and so we I was able to talk to her and she very quickly understood what I what I wanted we did a lot of prep work too with her so um, and but she understood what like if I said I, I could 
at first when we threw the cyan in, it was everywhere. And I was like, no, that's, the, that's not what I want. I want wherever the camera's pointed for the cyan to be a backlight spinning, nothing in the front. And so whichever direction we looked in, she was very, it, 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 she could quickly program a, a cyan light for a backlight that would, then, that would then spin around the room. So it was more she was there for the technical side of things. Yeah, but she also did suggest like uh, the um, eat, these movie theatrical lights, the color temperature always matches pretty exact for LEDs, but these she'd program in a red and it was just like this crazy red and then and then we had to fine tune where we because we had picked the color so we so we had picked the color and taken a color temperature reading but we had done it with sky panels and so then we're in a club with theatrical lights and the and the color temperature did not match the and the rgb um, did not match fun times it was fun it was a big experiment and so that sunday that's all we did was figure out exactly like fine tune that color and and figure out how we wanted the lights to move. And we played the music, because we had had the music for months, and so we played the music as well and started to make sure it was building and it was changing a little bit, because the number starts just sort of normal in a club, and then it gets pretty chaotic. And in terms of camera movement, is something you do in rehearsal as well? You figure out what kind of movements work? Yeah, I mean, in, in dance rehearsal, we obviously don't have a crane or a dolly, but we do moves, and, and there were times with our, just with our iPhones, and then there's lots of crane shots in this scene, and so we, John Chu, Chris Scott, and I would look at our footage on the weekends together and go, okay, well, we, we know we want something like this here, but then we want to all of a sudden sweep up, or we really need a high bird's eye shot um, there's this one moment we call the shine where you've got boys on one side and girls on the other dancing sort of battling each other and we want we knew we wanted a bird's eye shot for that and those are things you you know we're not getting in a dance rehearsal space yeah of course but you get a feeling for it how it's gonna how it's gonna work together yeah when the choreography and everything's going and you're rolling do you still change stuff or is that like it's locked because it's no, I mean, that's the really, really fun thing about working with people that you've known for 20 years or 15 years is that Chris Scott, John could have an idea suddenly and Chris Scott and I can quickly be really flexible and adjust. And, and, then, and, and our whole team, all the camera operators understood that, that there were gonna be moments where, where something was much better than we ever planned. And so we would need to change things. And, and or, or choreography would come in first thing in the morning and have to rework the whole number for the real space. Sometimes they'd get into the space earlier, but, but it was stuff we hadn't seen because we had only seen it in dance rehearsal. How many cameras were you using? We used three cameras for any big numbers. And then we have one, there's a single number, a one or called champagne, so we used one camera for that. Um, and then, and then there are, uh, we shot in practical locations in Washington Heights for 39 of our 49 days, and and this is a practical location. And and some of the apartments and stuff were really small, so we'd end up with one camera or two cameras for those scenes. Sure, and, but for dance stuff, you're doing coverage, I, I'm, because I'm so not unfamiliar. It's I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a 12 hour two day workout for all these dancers. So, um, so we are we are rolling three cameras no matter what. Our C camera operator, her name's Denise Bailey, was excellent at. She actually always had her camera on the ground on a slider, and in between each take, she'd move somewhere else. And we ended up with these really wonderful because because she could hide in the crowd. We ended up with these really wonderful low angle shots that we used tons of in the movie, and those weren't those weren't planned. Um, per se, versus our A and B camera, like had very, very specific shots that we had to get, and we do take after take after take. But C camera would move each set, each time we cut, she'd just move to another angle, even if it was three inches right or left. It just gave, or she'd throw on a different lens. It, I gave her like the freedom to make to almost be a documentary filmmaker in this scene, so that because we knew we needed, we would need some cutaways that we we didn't. And, and these dancers can only dance for so long. 
Sounds like it's really crucial, I mean, as always, but how do you prick your teams? How do you put that together to get that energy? Because that sounds... So I never had done a union movie in New York before. This was my first big movie, period. Um, I mean, I've done union movies, but this was a hu much bigger project than I had ever done before. And so I didn't know anyone in New York. Um, but the line producer was a, a someone who John Chu and I have worked with a ton, David Nixay, and he started introducing me to just like the most wonderful people. And I was in Vancouver doing a TV series, but New York is really busy like many, many cities in the world with production right now, and so I had to hire people without meeting them, and this was pre-Zoom, this was, this was January 2019, and so people didn't like think of having Zoom meetings, so I was having all these just phone calls with, with key grips and gaffers and, and, and camera operators and DITs, and I had to make decisions really fast because it was like, I mean, we shot at the same time as lots of movies that are coming out right now, so, um, or this year, and so it was really about if I clicked with someone on the phone to hire them, and then hopefully they, I, it really, we really did like each other. And in the end, it was just like the most wonderful, wonderful team of people. They were, they were my collaborators. Um, and actually, I love to tell people this, because I think it's one of the best things I learned on this movie, is that it was really important to me to, well, while I was in Washington Heights scouting, I started to fall in love with Washington Heights. And it was something that like, I couldn't inject into people without taking them there. And so I asked the line producer, can, can the team come with me? Can the key grip, the gaffer, and the camera operators go to Washington Heights with me for two days? And we'll wander around, and we'll look at the George Washington Bridge, and we'll eat Dominican food, and we'll sit on stoops, and we'll see people listen, playing their music, and, and we'll see the pigeons that nest in this one spot in, on our intersection. And we just walk up and down the streets. And when we were done, and, and two of them I had never even met in person before. So it was our first meeting. And, and we spent two days together. And it was really just this team building thing. And also, they understood what I was attracted to in Washington Heights. And they started, and it gave them a sense of, of ownership themselves of the movie, that they were important, and that they were part of making this movie. It's a beautiful story to do that way, and it's a privilege as well to be able to be a part in that kind of way because usually that crew comes, up, uh, you know, it's come along when it's technical. And right. I mean, usually the first time camera operators sometimes, I mean, don't even get invited to the scout, the tech scout. But, um, but so this was weeks before the tech scout that we got to do this. And then after that, I started doing lighting scouts. The camera operators didn't get to go to that, but we do lighting scouts at night in Washington Heights because we have a big number called blackout where the neighborhood has to go dark. And, and we couldn't, we had to figure out what storefronts we needed lights turned off and what, what street lights we needed the city to turn off. And so, um, and so we did all these night scouts, and then we, I, I did day scouts on my own just for watching how the sun, what the sun path was and, and what the quality of light was on our main intersection, because we shot at this one intersection at 175th Street and Audubon Avenue for four weeks. And it was at the longest days of the year. It was, it was like January 22nd to July 22nd. And, um, and so I did all these lighting scouts because we have, we have numbers with huge amounts of people, and, uh, and the AD was very generous and really worked with me to make sure we were shooting scenes at the time of day that I wanted to shoot them so that, so that I didn't have to bring in big silk overheads on, on cranes um, because the problem in New York is like if you want to move, if you want to move a, a lift with a, a silk on it, then you have it takes like seven cop cars to get to move anything and shutting down the street. And so then suddenly, by the time you get it set up, the sun's no longer there. So, so it was really important light study to do bef way before we started shooting. So basically, you were using available light and kind of dancing with it as, as far as you could. Yeah, I mean, there, obviously there were times that wouldn't work, but for the most part, we were definitely dancing with the light and shooting in the direction that the sun was best. 
what do you do if, if you know it doesn't work that he can go with it what is your general approach to something like that if we don't get to shoot at that time of day oh I mean there were several times you know something happened and the wardrobe wasn't right or and or I don't know the cast had to go back for to the trailer for something and then suddenly we've got this insanely bright sun and I have to adapt and so and in those times you know but I had been there enough that I was able to know okay we're not getting the cast back for a half an hour let's let's bring the lift in and start and start setting up start setting up some sun softening it seems like key just the way you prepped it and the way you were able to organize yourself around what's, what's, what's going on. Was that for interior locations too they were able to use that or did you just lit? The yeah, so, um, so our, two inter our two locations here, the interior of the bodega was a stage build and, um, and what was great actually was on the stage we, we had our, this, we built somewhat of the intersection. We didn't shoot exteriors there but we have views from from the bodega to the salon across the street so we had the same distance and we built a sky source with um it was 260 s 60s through um i can't remember what diffusion but through diffusion and um and i wanted i wanted it i wanted the sky to be as bright as the sky would be in new york so so, and we took color temperature readings when we, we shot all our exteriors first, so it was great, great matching. And um, so we took color temperature readings for each scene and we took brightness levels for what was outside and kept a very detailed record so that when we went to the set, set of the bodega, we could match the color temperature and the intensity outside perfectly. Okay, well, did you, do you reference that back when you're like inside? Do you look at the, st the stuff you've shot outside to kind of match it together? Because that's like a painstaking process sometimes yeah. to get that to work, no? Yeah, well, the bodega we were supposed to be able to do, we have tons of entrances and exits here, and we were supposed to do our entrances and exits at the real location, and this is a set, um, the art director and production designer were gonna dress just enough so that we could get those entrances and exits and three days before we started shooting the bodega the real bodega owner really got worried that if the his store was shut down for four weeks that he'd never have a way to make money again and everyone understood that and so we all agreed we'd figure out a different way because we really did want to make sure we weren't stealing from this community that they were they they were who are in, were our inspiration and I mean, most of the extras are all people from the neighborhood who did local casting calls. In the opening scene, we have something called the community chorus, where you, uh, there's people who are actually really doing their jobs that we went and filmed, and they're it, infusing the community within our movie was was very important to John Chu and Lin Manuel Miranda, and and in the in the whole crew. Yeah, it's an incredible responsibility when you come on with such a big production and you take over a part of a town, no? Yeah, I mean, this, this neighborhood hadn't had a movie made about it before, and the only time they felt that people came to make movies there or TV shows, it was always had to do with violence. And our movie, we don't have any bad guys, we don't have any villains, we have no weapons, there are no guns. It, it is truly trying to reach your dream is what this movie is about and that that is and what are those obstacles that you have to overcome yeah it's a different way of doing a movie then huh? yeah <laughs> like that cool um you're also showing tick tick boom i am uh, tonight i'm showing tick tick boom and tomorrow night or tomorrow afternoon so maybe let's watch a trailer because it's so interesting because both movies were shot in new york right yeah to see how that all blends together before we go into that, I just want to kind of sum it up because the, the amount of you know, knowledge you have on doing dance movies and stuff, how would you, for anybody who's approaching that for the first time, what are the go-to things you would look for? If, at the very beginning, I would see if I could go find a ballet class, not to take class, but to go watch dancers, um, or I, I think a class is better than like a performance situation because there's 
there's just, or go take the class and then don't be very good at dancing. I can't dance at all. But, but go and like really start to immerse yourself in how, how in movement and, and also watch action movies. I actually think dance and action movies are very, very similar. And the more, and people don't, you don't, people don't understand that musicals are just as technical and specific as action films. And it's, it's completely this, the same. In terms of the choreography of where cameras are gonna be and how you need to take care of certain things? Yeah, it, it, where cameras need to be, working with stunts, we work with choreographers, but it's the same thing, a stunt choreographer, a choreographer, understanding what angle will look best for, for that movement. And then, um, I mean, I remember, like, John Chu actually got an action movie at one point because he showed one of our episodes of the LXD to show he could do action because it is a dance and action are, are the same thing. There's one thing I forgot to ask. It was so interesting because you basically hired your crew just on the phone, right? What's your process of hiring people? What, what do you look for? Oh, I, I mean, I, I feel like it... I can call other people to find out if the people can do their jobs. It's definitely when I hire people, all I want to know is if I'm going to get along with them for a long time and if they're good human beings. And so just start talking about your family or how you grew up or your favorite movie or what you like to eat. I, I mean, those are the kind of questions that just like having a conversation and some, and. And at the end of the conversation, it's just like if it was a great conversation, then, then, then I start to dive into, okay, let me talk to five DPs that they've worked with and see what their process is like. Because anyone can sell you on their process, but I think it's harder to sell, sell you on if, if, if you're you know, a really enthusiastic, excited, nice human being. Yeah, because yeah, you've got to know your job anyway, right? And then what's left over, right? Yeah. And I, I mean, John, John always, John always makes, sh he's like, always tells every department head, only hire nice people. It's really, he's like, we're spending our days together for months and months and months. It's hard, we were sweating, we were in the total heat. We had really challenging days. Steam was rising off the ground and then days we were shooting cold, or the swimming pool scene where it was supposed to be hot was freezing cold and the pool was like 50 degrees, the water. And so it was, it's, it, it's like, okay, who do you want to be in the mud with for, for 49 days? And specific about choosing a gaffer for a movie, what, what, do you, what are you looking for in a gaffer, technically especially, or in, in the collaboration? I think a good listener, and I think I think it goes both ways for for me listening to the gaffer and for the gaffer being able to listen to me and understand me. And so I love to do tests really early on as quickly as possible, just so that we start a rhythm. I I worked with two different gaffers on um, on Tick Tick Boom and In the Heights, and I love them both. And they're both totally totally different, have totally different working ways they work. And, um, and I worked with the same key grip on both. And, and all three of them I just completely adore and would make movie after movie with all three of them. So if they're so differently in the way they approach it, how do you know that your vision comes across? Well, I'm looking at the footage. I mean, we're, we're making a movie together and, and, and I think I think both, both gaffers I worked with, uh, Charlie Grubbs did In the Heights, um, and he was a rigging gaffer for many, many years, and he was the perfect person to do In the Heights because we had these massive, massive pre-rigs, and his rigging crew was amazing. And then on Tick, Tick, Boom, it's a much more intimate story, and Bill O'Leary did that, and I mean, Bill O'Leary did Blade Runner, so he clearly can do big pre-rigs as well. But um, but he also says he, he's the only gaffer who doesn't like light, like doesn't like to use lights. And and he, his approach was very minimal, and that was that was really important for Tick Tick Boom. I I wanted it to feel very natural and very real. And actually, why don't we play the trailer and then I can talk about the look of Tick Tick Boom.
Hello. Hi. Welcome. I'm Jonathan Larson. I am 29 years old. I work at the Moondance Diner. Check. One sec. Do we take reservations? No, we do not take... We're, we're a diner. I have an original rock musical. Hey, boy genius. That I have spent the last eight years of my life writing. He's getting out. You're gonna be rich and famous. And rewriting. Did you crack it yet? Oh, I'm getting so close. And rewriting. Can I hear it? Any day now. Eight years! And the time keeps ticking. Tick, tick. You need to ask, are you letting yourself be led by fear or by love? Fear! A, a hundred percent fear! I don't know what the show is. Why do we play with fire? What if the workshop happens and nothing changes? What then, Jonathan? Maybe I'm just wasting my time. Do you know how many Jonathan Larsons there are? One. Why should we blaze a trail? There's not enough time. I went to three friends' funerals last year, and nobody is doing enough. I'm not doing enough. Try writing about what you know. What does it take to wake up a generation? It would be a tragedy to give up what you have. Take off and fly. Fear or love, baby, don't say the answer. Actions speak louder than words. No they speak louder. louder Keep than going. So this movie doesn't have like the same spectacle that In the Heights has, and and so when when I actually when I first started talking to Lynn about about Tick Tick Boom, we we had just finished In the Heights, and I was meeting with him, you know, to see if it would work for me to do his movie, and when I read the script page by page, I. Um, I could see my childhood in this movie. Jonathan Larson wrote the musical Rent, and he lived in this, that you saw here, a tenement apartment building with a bathtub in the kitchen, and his house was filled with his friends and his, all these artists and wonderful, just creative human beings, and, and his friends were really his family. And my childhood was very similar. I, we lived, my father was a playwright trying to make it as a playwright, and it was my sister, my mom, my dog and two cats, all living in 300 square feet, and my dad's friends filled our house, and, and my parents' friends, really, but, but it was all, this huge artist community, and I look back at that time where I was with all these great actors and great writers and great poets and great painters in, it was like a salon in our living room often, and, and watching, and we'd watch on our little teeny, television set, we'd all watch movies together. It was just this really wonderful time. And when I look back at that time in 19, and, and this movie takes place in 1990, and I was 10 years old in 1990, and so was Lynn, we're both the same age. And, and when, I, when I presented my ideas to Lynn, it was about, I, I showed him my photographs, and we started talking about how we wanted this movie to look like a something out of a child's hood, a child's memory of what New York was in the 90s. And because Jonathan Larson was a very childlike figure, he, he the for opening song's called 3090, which is about him being Peter Pan, and so, and not wanting to grow up. And so we wanted, we wanted New York and Jonathan's world to feel like a 10-year-old uh, what is etched in a 10-year-old's memory where color and light and emotions are all heightened. And sometimes the lines between reality and dreams are blurred. And that, and that moment where the reality and dreams are blurred idea is where we built our musical numbers from. And, and so that's where we started with In the Heights. I mean, tick, tick, boom. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's an incredible journey, right? if you're able to go back to something that's so emotional for you and to put it and to invest into the movie, you can only show in the results, right? Yeah, and, and actually the AIDS epidemic was, is, is the backdrop of this movie. And, um, and we started this movie during, and I, I remember being a child and being very, it, it was a, a very, I mean, my family definitely lost friends, like Jonathan lost friends to HIV AIDS. And, um, and so we started this movie before the pandemic. We shot eight days and then we shut down for six months. And then we came back and we're suddenly making a movie that has um, the AIDS epidemic in it and we're in the middle of our own pandemic and, and the real feel, feeling of like, how do we get COVID? How, you know, how can we not get COVID? And, and like, how can we protect ourselves? And, and all these lyrics Jonathan Larson wrote felt very true to this moment, even though he was writing them about, about AIDS. Mm, yeah, it's very touching. Do you, for the other movies you do, do you try to find emotional connection for yourself too, to be able to invest it into the images? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, for me, I, I feel like I'm definitely, what interests me about making movies is the emotional and intuitive connection to a film. I don't, I, I especially now, I have a six-year-old daughter and that, and when I had my daughter, things began to change for the types of stories I wanted to tell. And I realized I wanted to tell stories that, that would maybe one day inspire her, um, whether or not they are appropriate for her to watch at this moment in time, but, but things that I felt like, like were, were worth going out to make because I'm away from her for so long. And so, so she's really become an inspiration to me. And so when I, when I do a movie, I want to feel emotionally connected. I, there couldn't have been a, a more emotionally connected movie than this, I think, for me. But who knows? I mean, each, each script has something that, that can touch. Yeah, but you have to have the strength to actually allow yourself that, that, that place to say, I can be vulnerable. I can take that into, into something. Is that something when you, when you think about the people you work with, that you need a work environment where you're protected, where creativity can happen? And I was thinking especially a lot with productions where it's about no, no, no. How, how do you create that space? Well, on, on Tick, Tick, Boom, I did something very similar to In the Heights where, but instead of taking a tour of Washington Heights, I wanted everyone to know Jonathan Larson as a human being. I, all, the only thing I knew before I read the script about Jonathan was that he wrote Rent. That was my entire knowledge of him. But uh, right now, we have all these cameras pointed at us all the time. We have our cell phones running, and there's cameras everywhere. And we have no choice but to be filmed. And in 1990, that just wasn't true. But it was true for Jonathan Larson. And he, he had a friend whose father was a documentarian and she recorded his life. So we had eight years of video of him. And I would just watch the video with Lynn and the production designer and start to like just be completely amazed. And again, I, was, I fell in love with Washington Heights. I said, I said that was my, I knew that was my job. And on this, I realized my job was to fall in love with Jonathan Larson and to really, show the world his true spirit and that we learned from these eight years of, of videotapes. And um, it was pretty remarkable that we had them because he also didn't ever think anyone would see them, so he was very vulnerable. So I, sh so I brought a lot of the crew again, again to the office this time. There wasn't a big tour to do. We did look at some locations together, but we all got together and I started sharing. I shared, you know, I mean, Six years ago, I wouldn't have like said, "Oh, I grew up in a, a you know a tenement apartment building, and we didn't have any money." And I mean, I just wouldn't have wanted to share those things. But at, at, as soon as I read the script, I'm like, "Oh, I want to share my story." And so um, there, there is um, that 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 part of me actually make you know is part of me telling this story. So I need to share it. Yeah, and it's like. You feel it when you watch it. It's like it's so much more than just making nice images, and that depth just pays pays back ten times. No, makes for a better movie too. Yeah, I mean, we there were things we did on this movie that was very much about listening rather than planning. It was, it was, Andrew has this amazing process of in his acting, and and it was really about the camera operators being very in tune with that. And then we did some lighting cue things that 
were, we, I'd sit right next to the dimmer board op and we'd do things based on like what I was seeing in the performance on each take. And so it was, it was really this wonderful process of discovery every day. That's interesting. So you were adjusting the lighting within takes? Yeah, sometimes we'd adjust the light within takes. We did these car drive-bys for one scene where, I, or for two scenes where we wanted them on, not on specific lines, but like there would be specific things the actors were doing, and and I would just be listening. I'd have my I, a lot of a lot of people don't like to listen to the performance, um, but we were we because of COVID we sort of had to be like we couldn't be right on set, and so I always had on headphones listening so that I really could I could hear the breath, I could hear I I really understood what what Andrew was trying to do with his performance and just making sure I wasn't taking away or distracting from that. So because uh, you were mentioning earlier about that it's really a natural lighting approach that, that means you were lighting rooms or what is natural lighting for you? Yeah, we were lighting rooms. We oftentimes used, we used very few sor as few sources as possible. The apartment's mostly lit with practicals. Um, and, and the stage is all, we didn't do like moving lights on the stage. We wanted it to feel very true to 1990 and, and where Jonathan was in, in, sort of in, in his world when he does his performance, which is, it was a one night only show where very few people went and he, he, didn't, he didn't have success. It wasn't, he was not successful at this moment in life. And so we didn't want, we wanted to make sure we were true, true to everything about Jonathan. I mean, there's even, a few days before he, uh, two weeks before he passed away, he took this video camera and he was really scared there was going to be a fire in his apartment. And he literally took video of every single object in his apartment and described it. And so we knew where everything was. So, and the apartment's a complete recreation of his apartment. Um, the painting on the walls are exactly where they were, and they, his friends own them now, and so they loan them to the production. There's a blue flannel shirt that he wears in the movie, which was which Jonathan wore. I mean, and then, so everything that we had really was recreated based on, on what we knew and interviewing his friends. And it, it really, being true, true to Jonathan was everything to us. I remember there was this one moment where I saw, I, I, I watched Andrew transform into Jonathan Larson, and it was remarkable. We were watching sun, um, a Sondheim musical, Sunday in the Park, with George, and the cast, and Lynn, and me, and I was sitting in the back just like being removed just because they were having their moment watching this together, And but I saw, I suddenly saw that Andrew was Jonathan, and I snapped a picture, and I sent it to Lynn, and he sent it to John, John, Jonathan's real sister, and apparently it was very emotional because he really had transformed into Jonathan, and and so, and every single choice we made was was making sure that that remained true. How do you take care of this actor space and all the technical stuff that gets imposed on them? How do you create a safe space for them? We were a very, very, very quiet set. I think it's one of the quietest sets I've worked on, and it was lovely. Um, we, it was, it was, we didn't make change, we didn't do lighting changes once. We would do a rehearsal, and then Andrew and the other cast would step off, and we'd do our tweaks, and that was it. Once he was back, there was no more changing things. It was, it was about creating the space, and and also the room for him to move in space so that he wasn't locked into a mark because that's where the perfect light was. In this movie, there is no perfect light. It really is about, about a world. For the close-ups as well, you just change the lens or do you change the lighting too? Uh, in the apartment, again, we, use, I mean, we, we would tweak things a little bit, but it really was, we, we tried not to change too much. And like we didn't bring in eye lights. Like this movie has, we didn't bring in any eye lights or anything in this movie at all. And the practicals, you just let them be, or when they blow out, they blow out. Or how were you treating that? We we just made sure that the because we also we're a Netflix movie, so we and it will be on in HDR, and so that means you really want to protect your highlights. So we just made sure none of our none of our lamps were going to get too crazy. Just extended the lights. If you had a practical and there wasn't light coming off, you extended it, or um, no. I mean, okay. everything was in our dimmer board, and then, 
And then, um, and then, I mean, the apartment really was teeny tiny and we had a hard ceiling, so we didn't, there was not, there was not room. It, it was really about how light bounced off of different objects. Like, we had some practicals that we just would, like, just turn, like, hard practicals, like yeah. wire lamps that we just turn and bounce into things. Yeah, yeah, so had everything on the dimmer board, basically, all the practicals. All well. the practicals were on the dimmer board. Yeah. Cool. I think... Are there any questions from the audience before I continue to hammer Alice? Oh, sure. Questions? Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Almost like the process, like with target pattern and lighting, how are you choosing the? Oh, choosing the practicals. Oh, it was actually not even just between art department and lighting. We also have dance choreography, and that have to and and that so sometimes the choreographers also were very interested in our lamp choices. It was I mean it was a process. Art department would bring in certain lamps, and then there would be things that I wanted changed, and then there would be lamps that Lynn loved. There's this one red lamp that drove me completely bonkers, but he loved it, and so I was like, okay, we'll, we'll figure, we'll de deal with it, you know, because he's the director, he loved the lamp. But, um, but, but then the production designer was amazing too, his name's Alex DiGerlando, and we, we, he was in our storyboard sessions, which is the first time I've had the, the production designer in storyboard sessions, which was amazing. Him and the writer. I've also never had a writer in storyboard sessions. And because Lynn approaches, approached this project, this was his first movie directing, and so he approached it like he would a play. And it was, a, it was he didn't have to have all the right ideas from day one. It was really like, okay, let's draw it this way and let's explore what the scene would look like this way. And then, and then the next day we'd all come back and go, oh, no, that didn't quite work. What if we did it this way instead? And one of the biggest process, and, and so it was a huge discovery process. And one of the biggest discoveries that we found was in a number called swimming. If you want to go to that swimming pool. So um, we, we were location scouting for the swimming pool. We knew we had this piece of music that Jonathan had written 30 years ago called Swimming. And so we started looking at locations. And we saw this location. And Lynn loved this location because the lines on the floor, the tile for the lane lines looked like staff paper, music paper. And so then I took my iPhone, because I always have it, and I started, I put it under the water, and everyone's like, oh my God, your phone's gonna die. I'm like, oh, it says it's waterproof. And so then, and I started like filming underwater, and we found this perfectly positioned 30 at the bottom of the pool. And yeah, and, and it's this number that John, the opening number is called 3090, and Jonathan is so scared of turning 30 in 1990, is what the song is. and and. And it's because he feels like he has never, he ha, he's going to turn 30 and he hasn't done anything with his life. And so, and then Lynn sees from my phone this 30 right there at the bottom of the pool. And Lynn goes, what if he touches the 30 and it turns in, into a treble clef? And so this, and so that, and then that's how this number, I know no one's seen this movie because it's not out yet. And, but, but this is how this number became it was this discovery. We first saw the staff paper lines, and then we saw this number 30. And it was only later on that we found out that this was actually the swimming pool that Jonathan Larson swam in for years. And there's a lyric called, that says red, red, green stripes. And there's red and green stripes in the tiles. All, there's references to all these numbers, and everything is so specific to this pool, and we didn't, we didn't know. And there were lots of things about this movie that that were like this, where it felt like Jonathan Larson was whispering in our ear, guiding us in some way, and, and, and we felt the sort of sacredness of the project. I'm curious, um, I know Rob Marshall talks a bit about this idea of having to earn the musical numbers and build to a place where they feel kind of believable that that's the only way the characters can carry on expressing themselves. Is that something you talked about on either of these films, and is that something you're doing in the cinema sort of like you're building on that point as well? Yeah, I mean, I touched a little bit on it, it for In the Heights. I, it, in, in the Heights, we have a line at the very opening of the movie before the musical where Usnavi says the streets are made of music. And that gives us a little bit of creative license. And, but, but 
we did have to build from that from the time you see the manhole cover spinning to to them dancing on the side of the building you can't just open the movie with people dancing on the side of a building like the spectacle in that gets bigger and grander and grander and grander and then in this movie in this movie it the musicals come out of this childlikeness and so in, in tick tick boom the, the musicals come out of the childlikeness and we also have a concert as part of the storytelling element of the of the movie, so it's it takes place in 1990, and then um, a few years later, when Jonathan did this one man show at what's called the New York Theater Workshop in New York, and um, and so and it, it started as a one man show, and then became he ended up with a band and and, uh, and backup singers, but he uh, and that was the show Tick Tick Boom, which the movie's based on, and then and then we built out the world, the writer and and Lynn built out the world of 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 telling Jonathan Larson's story. For me, I think if I have an emotional a t a guidance on how uh, I I don't think I can just go into a movie and go, okay, we're gonna light this in yellows and reds and blues and greens and and just do it for no reason. I think I think I need an emotional connection and an emotional reason to tell a story. I think any time I want any time I tell a story it comes from a place of truth. And so the musical numbers for Jonathan are this blurred blurred line of dreams and reality in in his real life, not the stage part. And so and so I and that and from that point point is where I could start designing camera movement and lighting. Yeah, that's the vision, right? It doesn't matter which color it is. You've got something you're following, and it ends up where it ends up then, no? Yeah. 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 Could you please talk about your technical and creative relationship with Bill? Uh, for example, how much was you get for actually like a creative person on set, as opposed to him being just a technical equalizer? Um, I don't. Bl I, I don't believe in just working with technicians. I like to work with other people who bring some wonderful collaboration to the table and and are and want to tell the story we're telling. And um, and so so with Bill, we did. I mean, I always do lots of camera tests, and we had to get used to each other because we didn't know each other. And um, and just and going looking at images together and and talking about and talking about. Um, light and different film references that we looked at too. Like I looked a lot at searching for Bobby Fischer while I was making this movie, um, just because that movie does feel so natural. I, th our movie's not the same, but but it was a, the same time period, and and I liked their approach to the apartment in searching for Bobby Fischer because nothing was nothing was lit. Um, it things got dark and 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 people moved through space and I love that about that movie and so so we talked about movies like that and um, I'm trying to think what else we talked about but but his whole team too were part of that creative process like we um, we we had because we were making a movie in COVID we had so few people in zone A that that two of his electricians were also right with us. And it was really, really wonderful that we had all th the three of them and the dimmer board op. Like the f so the five of us just had this really wonderful partnership. And at the end, I was so sad to leave them. Well, thanks everybody for coming. And especially thanks, Alice, for being here. Thank you guys so much. It's so nice to, to get to be here and, and talk about this movie with you guys. Thank you. Thanks.